the Lake Michigan Angler Podcast. What's on, guys? Right here. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Lake Michigan Angler Podcast. I'm Rob, and this is Michael. And today we welcome special guest Dan Keating of Blue Horizon Sport Fishing. Captain Keating, welcome. Hey, good to be here, guys. Appreciate you for joining us on this uh, this episode uh, for Lake Michigan Angler Podcast. This is uh, um, quite the experience for, for Rob and I, kind of uh, setting this all up. We, you know, have been working on this. And, uh, of course, when we were discussing, you know, what we wanted this to look like, you were like, we, we got to get Captain Keating on here. Obviously, um, you're, you're renowned in the salmon fishing industry. Um, you're many, many people look to you and, and learn so much from you. You've paved the way in so many kind of different areas, which we hope to touch on here. And, and just from all the years of your experience and all the things you've done, uh, I can already tell you that we're not, we're not going to capture it all just in this episode. So we're definitely going to work to get you back on some future ones here. Cause I think it, it would be a disservice to try and cram everything in just one conversation and, and, and whatnot. But, um, but of course, just to recap, and there's always new people coming into the industry. Could you go ahead and give a little background on yourself? Yeah. Well, thanks. Thank you for the kind introduction. And I'm just, um, you know, I'm just uh, fortunate that my, uh, um, you know, I've fished ever since I was a little kid. And it was kind of like my hobby out of control got the best of me. And before I knew it, I'm spent most of my life on the water. Um, I started chartering. I started fishing in 1972 with my dad out of Chicago um, on a charter boat for cohos. And then we kind of moved up, uh, bought a 17 foot Boston whaler and we cut our teeth fishing out of a small boat trailering all over, you know, all over Lake Michigan, mostly on the Western shore um, pioneered canoe fishing back then. Um, not sure how smart that was, what we were doing in the <laughs> middle of winter, but we did it. Um, and I started chartering legally in 1983 and have been running, you know, fishing charters for most of my life. And I just have always had a passion for sharing what I've learned. And that led into writing books and then producing some DVDs and doing seminars and salmon schools and just just trying to share. I've been I've been super fortunate and blessed to have spent so much time on the water um, and I've learned how to catch fish morning, afternoon, sunny days, stormy days, you know, cause the customers always want to catch fish. You can't, you really, if you make an excuse on why the fish aren't biting or you can't find them, the charter customers don't come back. So just been, yeah, fish fishing a lot and uh, sharing that knowledge now. That's, that's uh pretty amazing. Um, I guess I, I think a good starting point for this conversation that comes to my mind is that here we are. It's, it's basically the off season, especially for charters and, and for the majority of boaters, right? You still have the hardcore out there that are open water with uh, winter fishing and whatnot. Um, but I think I'd like to start by having this conversation about what should folks be doing right now while you're not fishing, you got your boat stored up, you're kind of waiting around for next season. Uh, let's start the conversation on what are your tips on things people should be doing in preparation for the following fishing season. Yeah. Things you can be doing, you know, you kind of break it into uh, basically three categories. There's your tackle. <clears throat> so um, one of the things that I would do in the winter at some point, often with a good football game on TV or something, um, I would take my tackle and I would like dump it out and I would get these, I would get boxes and I would reorganize, especially my spoons. I would reorganize my spoons um, by brand, by color patterns, by size, are they UV, are they regular? So I would, I would have it all organized. Um, I would do the same thing with my flies. I would take my spring flies, organize them by colors, peanut flies, the two, the inch and a half slider flies, then your summer flies, your larger flies. Same thing with the flashers and crankbaits. I would organize it. What it, It's doing two things. Number one, it's going to save me money because I'm not going to walk into Rob's store and go, I need all these lures that I probably have <laughs> four of them. not a good thing to tell, tell Rob that. He's like, wait, be messy Sorry, and Rob. organize it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but what it will do is it'll tell me what I need. Because, you know, I'll, I'll have forgotten, you know, um, oh, golly, I broke off all those, you know, RV one her bread moon or whatever. I broke them all off. So you're now replacing what you need. 
The next thing that that does is that when you start fishing in the spring, you're not just taking all your lures and throwing them on the boat and going coho fishing or brown trout fishing. That's the disaster to do that. You have already got your spring lures nicely organized. Oh, and I mentioned my, bo- I, I mark my boxes. So on the edge of them, right. so I can see moonshines, um, peanut flies, how we flies, whatever. Um, it's all marked so that I'm organized in the spring with what I'm putting on the boat. And I'm when I'm on the water, I, I am organized. So I've got, I've got, my lures organized. <clears throat> That's a huge one. Um, and it, it, it actually can be fun, you know, have a beer or two while you're doing it, whatever football game, whatever, good movie. Um, it's actually fun. Then there's also your, your rods and reels. I know uh, I, uh, I do salmon coaching um, both in the regular, in the fishing season and the off season. And what I see is a lot of uh, small boat, multi-species fishermen getting into the salmon fishing and right. I call it graduating. They'll start out with running downriggers and diver rods, maybe some planer boards. Then they'll add some lead cork. Then they'll add some copper or whatever. Um, so organize your rods. Um, I use little spreadsheets. So I would write down how many of each one I had. Um, and, and again, when you're charter fishing, it's production mode. So you're going to have way more rods than the average angler. But uh, just, yeah, organize your rods. So again, you know what to buy during the off season. So you're ready for that. Um, so that that's kind of what you can do with your tackle. Um, as far as the second category of off season is educate yourself and network. Um, you know, we've got two salmon schools coming up at Rob's store uh, the last weekend in January. I know Rob's going to be running seminars on the weekends um, during February. And um Will that go into March, Rob? Yeah, I think we'll be having them February and March. I think we'll have after years, we'll probably do four of them. So it might even okay. get in the beginning of April. Yeah. So I mean, seminars are a great way to get, get knowledge from guys who have been out there and have, are willing to share their knowledge. Another thing you can do at these seminars, um, you can network. Um, and you can also do this by joining a fishing club. Um whether it's Salmon Unlimited, Illinois, Salmon Unlimited, Wisconsin, Indiana, um, Evanston Ramp Boat Club. Um, and I'm sure I'm missing a bunch. But if you join a fishing club, it's it's um, it's a good way to network. And I see a lot of people that they struggle to get people to go fishing with. You know, they're fishing by themselves or maybe one yeah. other person. And if they can add a third person, um, you know, they can run more lines. Uh, help each other out. So that, that's a good thing to do with, with the educating. Um, I have books and DVDs you can read in the off season. So obviously you can do that. Yeah. Um, there's articles out there, there's online stuff, you know, so uh, you can educate yourself that way. And then the third way, which is actually the funnest way is you can go down to a warm climate like Florida and go fishing and <laughs> believe it or not, while it's not salmon fishing, you can actually, I've learned things that I've applied to salmon fishing from my off season fishing in winter, especially when it comes to fishing the bottom, because like, if you go to the Gulf with, if you go to the keys or to the Gulf coast of Florida, you know, they really focus on that bottom and they don't have as much structure down there. Like a lot of the areas of the great lake. So you really learn how to, to fish structure. And even though you're fishing for grouper or snapper or kingfish or whatever, you know, there is some similarities. Um, for example, I was never a big meat fisherman. Um, <clears throat> I think I needed it. Um, and then from fishing with my dad's neighbor, Eddie, the, uh, from Boston with a crazy accent, he taught me how to fish live bait for smoker Kings, amberjack and tuna, um, and big grouper. And he showed me just the little differences, both with the dead bait, but also with the rigging of the live bait. And again, we don't use the live bait swimming on the great lakes, but there is, there's a knack to tweaking how you rig the the meat in it. And I came back from that, that first uh, winter that we went down and fished with him. My son, Ethan caught a bunch of huge fish. Um, I paid a lot more attention that next year on Lake Michigan and caught a lot more fish with meat. Wow. It's like, it's like little things, things, right? That's, that's pretty cool. Like, yeah. uh, learn the little things and when you talked about the bottom uh, you're, you're talking about the the structure on the bottom right like the bottom of the water whether it's um what uh, you know out there in the ocean i don't know what the bottom is like but uh i'm guessing that's what you're referring to yeah oh absolutely there's you know 
you know, there's nuances in the bottom, whether it's a drop off, whether it's it's like in the ocean, it could be live bottom with the uh, the red types of dirt. They're not really a coral. They're more of a fan. Um, limestone um, areas where drop offs make bends, humps, areas where the drop offs come closer together. There's all these little subtle things that most most people don't even pay attention to. Um, they're not even aware they're there. And so what, what, you know, like, and you can do the same thing with walleye fishing and apply it to big water fishing because walleye fishermen spend a lot more time focused on that. You know, what is the bottom doing? What are right. the nuances? What are the subtle differences in the bottom that are impacting the current holding bait fish, um, ambush points, attracting fish, you know, it's just something that sticks out and grabs those fish. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really important. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And before we get ahead of ourselves, uh, we, you know, you circled back and, and you mentioned the, you know, these three key areas where you can spend your off season, you know, in preparation uh, for the next season, which was, you know, your tackle, your, your lures um, and educating yourself. Um, and, and we're going to have you, we're going to host you here for, for the salmon school and just, just briefly, uh, you know, a synopsis for those folks that um, are curious about what, what that's about. Could you just give a little bit of info so that uh, they know, and, and then hopefully we can get them in here for that date. Yeah. Yeah. The salmon schools, um, you know, we, we did two of them. So um, the first day I call it salmon one Oh one foundations. It's more of a entry level course, but we see a lot of guys that are really good fishermen that come to it. Cause it is a good refresher. And, and what we, you know, we have, coffee and the best donuts in the world. So if you don't get any fishing information, you can at least get good donuts out of it. But uh, no, um, basically it runs from nine o'clock until three o'clock. We try to make it fun. Um, I encourage questions and participation. It's a very visual, um, uh, um, school. We use a lot, use PowerPoint with a lot of slides. Um, I have Duke Jansen, uh, salmon fisherman from Milwaukee and artist, we make diagrams, so it, 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 it explains it. But the day one, if someone is um, new to the sport or maybe they're an inland fisherman and they've just been dipping their toes into big water fishing, day one is, is perfect because it will, it'll, it'll shorten your learning curve, um, save you a ton of money um, and gas. And so what we do in the beginning of that day one is we're going to look at boat setups. Um, one of the things that I've learned from, from chartering and I fished alone, I was, didn't have a first mate a lot of times. So I learned how to make my boat extremely efficient and you can do that whether you fish on a 17 foot boat or a 37 foot boat, the more organized your back deck is and how you mount things, the more effective you will be when you're on the water. So we'll talk about boat setup. We're going to talk about tackle selection. Um, I'm always amazed at how many people are, you know, using the wrong types of rods and reels for different applications. So we'll talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about lure selection on that first day. Um, lure selection can be a little overwhelming. <clears throat> we're also going to talk about um, how to deploy the different tactics because, you know, for guys who have been doing this for 20 years, it's not a big deal second nature but a lot of newer fishermen they're not familiar with how to run everything right so we'll talk about how to use the downriggers how to use copper line how to tie the right knots for copper line how to untangle copper line lead core wire line um weighted steel we're going to talk about all those different things and the little tricks to make it more efficient so you're not fighting with your tackle while you're out there um and then we finish up day one with kind of a big you know, more of a looking at spring fishing and then we're going to really zero in, you know, on that Waukegan to Racine corridor. And it's also very applicable to Chicago land, but you know, how do you catch fish in that early season um, when the water's cold? So that's, that's day one um, does include lunch. We got some, some, you know, goodie bags and really good raffle prizes. Day two is a more advanced school. Having said that you'll get guys that'll, do both days, beginner and right. advanced together. But day two, we're going to focus. We're going to talk a lot. We're going to talk about the lake, the the ecosystem. Um, I am a big proponent of the more you understand about the environment and the, the fish, 
the game fish and the bait fish, the better you're going to be at catching them. So we're going to talk, we're going to talk about that, what we're dealing with. What does that playing field look like? We're going to, we're going to take a seasonal approach and we're going to look at each species. We're going to look at Kings, coho, steelhead, brown trout, lake trout. And we're going to walk with each species, spring, summer, fall. How do you find them? And then how do you catch them based on the season? Within that, um, I'm going to talk about what goes on in my head. What, what are the decisions I make when I head out on the lake? Cold front may have just came through and no one fished in three days. How do we find the fish? How do we know where to look? And really for the average angler who does not get to charter and fish, you know, five, six, seven days a week, right. that's your biggest that's your biggest challenge that, that is, you fish when you haven't fished in two weeks. Yeah. Um, those internet fishing reports only take you so far. Um, so we're going to talk about that. Um, talk about how, the tactics you use. And I'm a big proponent of multi-species fishing. And you really need to do that now um, to, to catch big numbers of fish. So within the season, we're also going to talk about how do I fish for lake trout kings and steelhead maybe all at the same time throughout the water column. How do I run a spread of lines like that? You know, we get, we get into the diagrams, whether it's a small boat or a large boat or a medium boat, because different guys fish different ways. Um, so that that's a big part of day two. Um, we also do a, a deep dive into currents. Um, and, you know, um, Michael, we could do a whole podcast on currents because oh, that's, bet. that's, that's, it's complicated, but the guys, you know, the guys who have figured out the currents are the ones that are consistently catching the fish. Yeah. And so we try, I try to help people with understanding that. And then the, the last thing we're going to do on day two, did this this summer at a club seminar down in Evanston. And I got some really great emails from guys afterwards about how it helped them. We're going to actually have some charts of some local structure off of, off of different ports. Um, and I'm going to talk and show how I approach that structure, what parts of those structures hold fish based on what direction the wind is. And then how do you make your trolling passes on that? So yeah, that's day two. We're going to cover a lot of ground and I, you know, we have a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. So if you guys are interested, you know, link down below, get all the information. You can sign up, you can attend and, uh, and get that. And for all the various reasons that Captain King has mentioned here, I think that's great. Um, and, and then you can also stock up on gear early on, you know, because it goes fast. It goes fast. It's hard to and get. It's hard to get. <laughs> it's hard to get. It's, yeah, that's one of the nice things about doing these these schools in, in in a store like Rob's is because it's it's one thing to read an article and oh you caught it on this that and the other thing and it was on a thirty two inch leader blah 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 but to actually see we'll have the baits up there yeah. we're gonna have a guest presenter each day um, there as well um, you'll actually be able to see the lures that we're using yeah. and you can walk right into the store and get the exact one so you're not going two months later going, what one was that? What color was yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Um, and one of the great things, you know, that, that Rob does is he's got a lot of rods already set up. And so for a lot of guys getting into this, um, it's just easier to get the rod and reel fully loaded with 200 feet of copper or whatever, whatever it is. So, yeah. So all those reasons are right there. You should know by now whether or not you're going to be here for that. Um, so, so Dan, let me ask you a uh, conversation Rob and I had recently um, in a, in a prior episode was kind of like our 2021 recap of, of how the year went for us fishing, what we kind of noticed and how we felt about it. And I wanted to ask you, how did 2021 fish for you? What did you think about it in comparison to, let's say, you know, roughly the last five years uh, in the fishery? Um, how, did, how did that go for you? What did you think about it? I, I You know, <clears throat> um, I think the fishery is on an upswing. Um, I, I, I have... You know, I fished through the BKD thing, through the no more ale wives, the sky is falling. <laughs> um, you know, it used to be you caught a lake trout that was exciting, you know, in some years. Now the lake trout are a nuisance. So I thought overall, I, I thought, you know, I thought lake wide, I, I, I thought it was on an upswing. I thought the coho fishing was very good. Um, the kings were big. Yeah. Um, the Kings are still, they're still 
I think there's more Kings. I think they're coming back. I know guys in Michigan that were fishing into November, going out deep, catching one, two, and three-year-old Kings, numbers of them. Wow. And that's encouraging for the fishery. You want to see the age classes of Kings, but here's the thing with the Kings. They're not all over the lake like they were in the 1980s and in the early 2000s. Okay. But there are big schools. There are good schools of them that move around. Um, so when you can hit those schools, you can catch numbers of Kings. Um, but when those big schools aren't there, which w- what was nice is last year, you could still always get, you know, you could get one, two or three of them mixed in with your catch, which is really nice. If you can, while you're coho fishing or lake trout fishing, you can pop some big Kings in there. Um, I thought the steelhead were moving around. I thought the steelhead, while there weren't as many as there have been in some years, I thought there were still good numbers of them. Um, so in the lake trout, the lake trout are what the lake trout are. They're everywhere. Um, so I, I'd say, yeah, that the health of the fishery is definitely, uh, it was definitely good and the fish were healthy. I think that's a big thing on it too. Yeah, and lots of definitely. guys all around, all around the lake. I stay in contact with people uh, all around the lake and, um, Everybody seemed to be seeing ale wives. Yeah. And, and the big the, ones too. Big, there were some really big, big and, and they were thick. I, yeah. I, I, early spring when they were in the harbors, you know, I accidentally catch one. I'm like, oh, these got some shoulders on them. There's some thick ale wives. They're yep. healthy. Yeah. Which is, a, it, it's encouraging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I try to be a hopeful person. So mild winter so far, right? Yeah. Uh, warmer water. That's, you know, ale they get a little fragile when it gets too cold. Those, you know, so it's really long. Remember those really tough winters we had where it was like, you know, polar yeah. blow forever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. you know that's what killed the alewives yeah. so warmer water mild alewives so all those big alewives will have a good spawn hopefully and, and, and yeah keep on good. keep us keep us going to see some uh yeah you know it was one hell of a year remember we we had the uh, on the michigan side they pulled that 46 pound king 47 yeah 47 pound king ridiculous we saw quite a few quite a few of us over here caught our first 30s mm-hmm. so like yeah. it was pretty pretty cool this year with, with the kings and and then uh, we saw that really crazy run of steelhead offshore. Yeah, and like toward late, the end of the season, you know, this, late August, yeah, September, like, there was, was a lot of steelhead. It was really, really good stuff. Yeah. You know, what are you thinking? Do you do you think we kind of see more of the same going in, into 2022 with, with the fishery? I think so. I do. I think the, um, you know, a big part of that, I'm basing that on is just the health of the fish that we had. Yeah. Um, I do believe there is more natural reproduction happening in Michigan and Lake Huron, and, and we get to swim over it. We get the benefit of it. Um, the coho are proving to be an incredibly resilient fish, and the coho fishery is very strong. So I think, I think we'll have a strong spring, um, and I think there's going to be big kings again. Um, just on the size of them last year. So yeah, and the size of the three year old fish we were seeing was just mass. I mean, there is immature forty inch fish out there. Yeah. So Jesus. yeah, I mean, it's enormous. They weren't real heavy, but they were long, and you know that they're going to be heavy in twenty twenty two, and uh, really looking forward to catching some of those. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I do think if a guy, you know, I think your chances are as good now of getting a 30 pound plus King as it's ever been in the history of this lake. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, we did. Even it. though I wasn't always fishing for him, it just seems that way. There's so many being caught these days. Yeah. It's going to be a good time. Um, let me ask you this. I, I, I noticed this that, uh, you know, we, we've seen over this past year as well, and you mentioned it to um, folks, as you called it, graduating into Lake Michigan fishing. They were inland guys, maybe they're walleye guys, or even we saw a lot of bass guys. Quite a few bass guys came in and Rob hooked them up. Hey, this is what you need. Got them the, the, the setups, the rod, the reels, the tackle, the lures. Um, and they, they experienced experience some success here. Um, and we also saw folks that were looking to even step it up and go into uh, uh, charter guiding and all that. Um, so with you having just a wealth of knowledge and experience as a charter captain, uh, what would be some tips and some advice you would give someone looking to become and step into that uh, into that world? Because it is different than weekend fishing and personal pleasure fishing. Uh, what were some, some areas of, of advice you would offer? To stepping into the world of becoming a charter captain? Correct. Um, wow. 
That's a really good question, Michael. Um, <laughs> we could do a whole I'm, I'm, yeah, I know, I know. I, a, set you I actually up. thought about doing a salmon school on on just that. I, on, I would on, think that'd be valuable because there are like we've noticed this year, guys were like, "Hey, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm catching a lot of fish, and now I want to be a captain." Now, you know, oh, so sometimes you might get ahead of yourself, <laughs> but but the, yeah, they're, they're showing me. interest. Yeah, me and Nick, Captain Arnie can set them straight on that one. No, um, <laughs> Rob, you understand that. Yep. <laughs> uh, no. Okay, so if you want to be a charter captain, you got to love, you have to love being on the water, love fishing. And if you enjoy being with people, that's really helpful. Because at the end of the day, catch, catching fish is absolutely important and doing it safely and, and smart. But you got to like people, too. Because there's a lot of charter captains that are hard on people and you cannot be hard on people. Um, the average person who steps on a charter boat has no clue what's going on. They may be escaping from, you know, fill in the blank with stress in life. And so this is, this is relaxing for them. Um, so the best advice I could give someone who wants to do that is to, you know, the more time you spend on the water, um, just learning the ins and out of your boat, the lake and how to catch fish. Um, but, um, yeah, um, that's a hard question. Um, yeah. Um, take some psychology and bartending classes. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, Cause really when you're chartering, you're as much a counselor and a friend as you are a fisherman. Um, that's true. That's, yep. true. that's so, a good point. You know, so you, you'd want to, um, you know, upgrade your tackle. Yeah. You know, you're going to need a broader selection of tackle and multiple. You're gonna need more tackle. Yeah. Because when you're charter fishing, you're going to lose equipment. I have to break it to you. Cause you're going to be, you're going to be fishing more, which is good. That's a good thing. So, and also if you've got that yellow spotted spit and glow, that's catching all your fish, you need more than one. So yeah. you can, you know, catch a lot more. Um, and start networking with people. Start, Getting the word out there. If you're going to really go into chartering, start with, you know, what's in front of you. What, what is your network? What are your friends? Where, where you currently work? Where, what are the, what people from there are potential customers that would benefit from your service? That's really big. How are you, how are you going to network? The other thing that's, that's, that's big. Um, and, I, and I do think the charter the charter industry used to be enormous um, back in the seventies and eighties. I mean, North point, was full of charter boats and then it went down and i do believe there's an interest coming back right. in it i think it's tied to the economy people um re-education so there's more people charter fishing i believe um so you need to do something to set yourself apart that's i guess the biggest thing i can give you what makes you different than the other guy on the dock and it has to be more than just price you know, I mean, there's always those people who want to shop by price. So if you want to compete for those people, that's one way to do it. But what's going to set you apart? The other thing, um, see, we should do a whole day on this one. Yeah. Um, start should, taking yeah. really good pictures. <laughs> yeah. 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 Build your tribe. Con- content, media. Yeah. content is king. It, it really is. And that a lot of times that will sell the individual on, on uh, booking a trip with you. They see the quantity of fish, you see big fish and, you know, um, and that helps. It just tremendously yeah. does. And like with the pictures, if it is a more professional looking picture, yeah, it all it just automatically gives you more credibility as a fisherman. It seems, especially yeah. if you're a charter or a guide of any kind, mm-hmm. rather than some picture that looks like you took it with a Polaroid. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, he he pulled his grandfather's picture. What is this? I'm yeah, not, I'm not gonna exactly. That that's actually really good. To me, I just think that'd be interesting if that was an additional segment of a salmon school because that right there, that's a whole lot of. Anyway, that's just my thoughts. But yeah, it'd be you like know. an extra certification to become a captain. Not only do you have to get your six pack, but you got to pass Captain Dan's test. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Set all the rigs up and get it going. Um, let me ask you, uh, 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 Dan, about um, when we look at the entire um, kind of the lake and we see fish migrating all over. I mean, they've said that these fish will migrate all through the whole connection of the, of of the great lakes from here to there. And it's pretty incredible when you think about it. Um, And it does make sense because they, you know, they come from salt and they travel hundreds of thousands of miles or whatever. Um, But when we look at 
throughout the year period of the season, what would you say uh, maybe the one area or, or general area where we te- were, where, how do I word this right? Where it seems to be the most consistent as far as fishing goes. I, you know, when I, I always felt, and and I have had the, the privilege of being able to fish really, you know, all over on Lake Michigan. I always felt that that, you know, that, um, that corridor, if you draw a line across the lake from about Waukegan, just south of Waukegan up to about Racine, maybe South Milwaukee, I always felt that segment was the most consistent over spring, summer, fall. Not that other ports don't have their moments where it's, you know, it's game on, right. but it was partly to do with the Southern part of Lake Michigan is more shallow. The Northern part of Lake Michigan is deeper. Um, and so we're kind of getting the best of both worlds. Uh, I believe the Southern part of Lake Michigan um, is more fertile than the Northern part um, just because it's warmer and there's more of the plankton and the L- whatever for the alewives. Um, and you've got some really interesting structure that happens between in that area. So I always like that area and you've got the cohos, the numbers of cohos, which can fill in a lot of gaps and you still have the King fishery. The King fishery is not as good as those Northern Michigan points at ports. Absolutely. And, you know, Northern Wisconsin ones when they're on, but there's still enough Kings there. We've got great steelhead fishing there. Um, at times the brown trout. Rob, I've heard there's a lot of brown trout in the harbor right now. Yep. <laughs> not sure if I'm supposed to say that, but. Yeah, that's not that's fine. <laughs> um, the word's out. Yeah. Yep. Dean is sending me pictures of the fish he's catching in there. <laughs> so shout out to Dean. Keep fishing, Dean. And don't forget to go to school. Um, and you got the lake trout. You know, Illinois probably got more lake trout than any other state uh, because of the, the natural reproduction on the couple of reefs down there. So yeah, it's hard not to go out and catch a good box of fish in that area. They caught a they caught a, it was a giant uh, Laker caught out of Chicago. Out of, out of, um, what was the charter? I forgot. Out of Matros confusion. Confusion caught yep. a giant one. The this state year. record. Yeah, the new Illinois state record. Yeah, was it uh, was it in the forties? I don't was remember. It's in, it's in my dad's basement. I don't even remember how big <laughs> it is. Um, it's it's a monster. I think what well, it's got to be thirty nine. It's upper thirties. I don't yeah. think it broke forty, but yeah, it was, it's uh it's a really big fish, and there's just a billion of them. It might be like the most lake trout in the world. I Any mean, like a, down the southern half, like from the state line to the southern tip of Lake Michigan, yeah. might be like the highest population or density why, of why, lake I'm, trout anywhere. Is why is it that they get such a bad rap? Um. Well, I'll let Dan answer that because he's been. <laughs> I know, like you just threw it. Just the I'm just going to deflect that one. No, I, I mean, um, it, it, it's, I'm just curious. I mean, there's a lot of different opinions about it, but uh, you know, I see it as when I'm on the water personally, uh, and I understand there's different things. Uh, you know, I just want to catch fish, and I'm happy just to be out there enjoying enjoying the experience, and I'd rather catch something than nothing. So if there's a coho not around, if there's not a king around. I got a Laker. Cool. I'm having fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I think it really goes back to before I was really fishing on Lake Michigan and like during BKD, maybe when that's kind of all there was to catch. What, what, what's BKD for those that. And well, Dan could probably give you a more detailed okay. uh, explanation of it, but uh, bacterial uh, kidney disease. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And that was really affecting the salmon back then. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, the lake trout, I think more so back then than now, they didn't taste as good. I think now we have some better tasting lake trout mm-hmm. and they've never, you know, they're never going to fight as well as a king. So uh, I think back then people just kind of got sick of lake trout and gotcha. the, um, it just kind of carried over. Gotcha. So kind of just, uh, okay. But that being said, I get people all the time coming to the store that, um, you know, they've been taught how to catch cohos and taught how to catch kings and steal it, And they're catching all these fish and they just want to, catch lake trucks they've never caught them before they want to yeah. learn how to target them yeah and they're they create a really good fishery there's a ton of them yeah. and you can have a lot of fun you can catch as many as you want sometimes yeah because when they're on they really go go to town you can really just nail them and 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 captain keating um you know one area that we don't talk a lot about maybe we need to dedicate an episode to this but tournament fishing which is a whole different thing you need to catch you need lake trout correct yeah. Oh, yeah. 
if it for the weight, they're big. And Rob, do you think a 40 pound lake trout is going to be caught this year? Uh, it, if it's not, it's going to happen at some point. Cause we know there's gotta be fish over 40 pounds in Lake Michigan. You know, like if a 50 was caught, it wouldn't surprise me at all. It's just a matter of somebody of, running across that out fish. Out of Chicago, maybe Indiana waters, probably. Best, Anywhere. best options? Any, I mean, that's where the most are. Yeah. You know, so if you're going to target them, that's a great area to go. There's somewhere there's going to be a 40 caught. It's got to happen. I'm, I'm kind of stunned it hasn't happened yet. And I think part of it might be that there's so many out there to weed through before you get to that 40. <laughs> He's smarter. He didn't make it that far without just. Exactly. I know that spinning glow. I'm not going for it this yeah. time, guys. <laughs> I wonder how many 40s have been hooked because, you know, lake trout, a lot of times the way they hit, they're hooked like really poorly. And they're those big trout, you know, especially if the water's still cold, you know, if the water, you know, it's the trout get the bad rap when you're dragging them from 150 feet down and where it's cold and you're dragging them through 70 degree water, that zaps them. But if it's cold, if that water's cold top to bottom, it's a different fit. It's a different animal. Oh yeah. But I wonder how many people have just tightened up on it. Cause they didn't have the patience on that huge trout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's definitely, it just, it doesn't take a run. They just, it might not feel any bigger than a smaller lake trout initially. And they just kind of force it in and then it gets off. And I, I'd be stunned if people haven't hooked into forties by now. Yeah. And you're right. And like the, in the spring when the water's cold top to bottom and you've got, um, you've got shallow fish, they're a blast to catch, whether you're jigging or casting form or trolling, you know, it's a totally different fish. It's like, yeah, it's in almost water. Yeah, yes. Completely yeah. different. Now, now's a good time. Um, on, on spinning tackle, a lot of fun. Yep. You know, early spring, I'll, I'll, you know, when, so I start fishing, so I'm in the kayak, but I'll start my season down in Indiana waters, um, early, early spring, you'll get some of the coho in there. And then those Lakers are in pushed in and yeah. you know, hooked them up. And they're a lot of fun because that cold water, they just they got a lot of life. Yeah. I them. actually really looking forward to catching them in the early spring because there's something bigger to catch than the coho. It's like you get so many yeah. cookie cutter cohos. Good it's nice. Stuff, yeah. yeah. It's nice to get like an eight or 10 pound or bigger lake trout mixed in with all the cohos. Yeah, I also saw something too. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried this, uh, Dan, but I, I saw. I can't remember where I saw it. Maybe it was a uh, some folks in the Great Lakes, not necessarily Lake Michigan. Maybe it was Superior or something like that. But what they would do, kind of to alleviate that issue of oh, they don't fight good, um, they would run spinning rods on the on the downriggers uh, with lighter line for the for the Lakers. So you know, mm-hmm. and give them a better kind of experience. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Maybe something folks might want to try if they feel like. Yeah, you know. definitely get some light spinning tackle for your metal dodgers. And <laughs> and you just go through a lot of metal oh, dodgers that way. That. <laughs> Run all those metal dodgers on that light line. <laughs> uh, yeah, some guys really want to. You got a little extra money to spend. We're here. We got, we'll have plenty for you. In, in, in the years that you've been fishing, you've seen this lake transform. I don't even know how many times um, it, when you think about over, over, over your, your lifespan fishing on the water, what's that one period, maybe two period where that, that you felt really kind of were defining points in the lake changing. Uh, I think we're coming through one right now. I okay. think this is, the, this is the biggest one going forward over the last five years, Wow! because I think, you know, going back in time, but the beginning of the fishery, when the um, the lake trout were decimated, they got the lampreys under control. The alewives went bananas. Um, they were 98% of the biomass, 98% wow. of every living creature um, in, in, in the Great Lakes um, was an alewife. So there was food everywhere <clears throat> for these fish. Um we're never going to have it like that where a salmon can just open his mouth and feed. But I, I think because of all the exotic species that have come into the great lakes um, with the, the, the zebra mussels, the quagga mussels, all the little cr- critters that are in there, the bloody red shrimp, you know, all of them. I think the lake went through this period of adjustment and I think fishermen and the DNRs went through a period of adjustment. There was that period where, you know, when the Kings crashed, 
it crashed and there was a lot of whining and doom and gloom. Um, I know a lot of guys went out of that charter business. I just burned gas and go, we're going to go out deep and we're going to catch steelhead. Or we're going to learn how to catch lake trout. You know, we're going to catch fish. Um, and then the Kings came back. We had that boom. We had some of the best King fishing ever in the early two thousands. And then they went down again. Cause you know, then there was the doom and gloom of the ale wife and the sky is falling. But then we had, we learned that there's natural reproduction going on. And then it seems when the King population went down, the coho population absolutely thrived. We have some of the best coho fishing we've ever had. And then the steelhead kind of took off and we learned how, um, we learn how to catch them, you know, and it's not that the steel had haven't always been there. I think of a friend of mine back in the uh, early 1980s that used to just disappear out of sight over the horizon in his small boat and come <laughs> back with a box of steel. Hut. People would be like, where'd you get those? Um, he was the guy that had the guts to go out there. And I think more and more people have the biggest adjustment. Michael is the fisherman. We've adjusted how we're going to fish. Okay, I can't go three miles and catch a limit of big kings. So I still want to catch something other than a Wally bluegill or a bass this weekend. Mm-hmm. So what are my options? Burn gas, go out deep, chase steelhead. Maybe go to trailer down to the southern part of the lake and fish for cohos. Learn how to catch the lake trout, um, which like you mentioned, Rob, I think they do taste better with their new diet, You know, eating a lot of gobies and stuff like that. Um, scale down your tackle. I run 12-pound line. So you can put that spread of flashers down on the bottom to get the trout all excited and then stick a f- couple of rods with a spoon or a, a plug on light line stop your boat and fight the fish. You know, it's a lot funner that way. Um, if you're not in a charter, you're not in a hurry, you know, make a fight out of it. So I, I think right now we're adjusting and I think the lake has adapted. I think the lake, I think the great lakes are incredibly resilient. Um, I do in my book that came out last year, big water wisdom. There's a, it's a Q and a book. Um, there's a part in there where I talk about a little bit about the the ecosystems of the Great Lakes and how it's adjusted. Um, and I think I think we're we're I think we're coming into a really good stretch with it that the lakes adjusted. We've got all these different organisms in there. The fish are feeding on some different things. We've still got alewives. We've still got kings. Um, so I think it's I think it's going to be a great multi species fishery f- um, for years to come. Yeah. I was, I- it was really well said. I I I agree. I think. Um, what did you say, bro? No, keep going. Oh no, I I just think yeah, like it was a great point. Um, especially in terms of, uh, you know, we in the in the fishing community can be really headstrong and set in setting our ways and, and beliefs. And I think what you said about um, us starting to adapt and, and change our mindset and, and starting to understand the water and fish it, and and we're realizing well. Yeah, there's it's there there are still fish here. It's not a, a gloom and doom and stuff like that, which is really interesting. And another point is what you said is, you know, running 250, 300 feet out for those um, steelhead when everything closer. Remember this year, it was tough. It was the water was piss warm for a long time, like yep. right from salmon to Ramo, It got tough. Um, and and you had to run out like two fifty. I remember we were giving fish reports. All right, guys, you're gonna start at two fifty, and a lot of guys would come in here like two fifty, like yep. you know, which is a good point about your advanced school when you talk about you know finding these fish. You know, you're in the middle of the water, you don't see land. That can be daunting for someone that's relatively new, but that's where the fish are. So what are you gonna do? Are you not gonna fish, or are you gonna educate yourself? Um, network because it's better to go with, you know, with buddy system, go with somebody in your boat, invite someone. I see folks on Facebook groups saying, hey, I got an open boat. You know, if you either, even if you don't want to throw gas, just come with me because I'd rather just have someone with me to make a run and, um, you know, different ways to go about that. But uh, it, it, it speaks to what Captain Keating here is, is talking about where get the education, you need to go to where the fish are, you know, you can't force them to eat what you want to throw in the water. You, you got to find out what they want and, and that's how it works. You know, yep. a big part of going offshore when you're going out deep and all the stuff is having good electronics. And, uh, you know, the thought comes to mind here is, uh, you know, what should folks really be utilizing when they're out here, um, way offshore, you know, for finding the fish and obviously for their safety, what are, what are some things they need to be, uh, considering for this? Yeah, uh, this is the short answer. Day two of the salmon school, the advanced school, and that one will sell out because we limit limit attendance on it. Um, 
I know Rob's not a fan of having people sit on top of each other in there. <laughs> um, but um, the short answer is, you know, pick your days, obviously. Um, this is not electronics, but there is strength in numbers. So if you know other, other, you know, if you network and you know other guys that are going out there, it's a huge, you got the safety issue, but it's a huge advantage. Because when you're offshore, when you're 10, 12, 15 miles out, you can be here and the fish are two miles south of you and you'll never know it. That's why charter boats, you know, we networked, um, you know, between Waukegan, North Point, Kenosha. Um, I tried to get along with everybody because information is king. And so you could sometimes co- coordinate where the fish are. So you get a handful of guys that are friends that go out on that calm Saturday and fan out when they're out there. Someone's going to hit the fish and then you can all move in and work them. Um, as far as electronics, I had a, I had radar us on my cell phone, which in my phone worked way out. Yeah. You know, for whatever reason, my coverage did that's nice for watching the weather. So you, if you see a storm in the summer coming up, you can see it on that. That's nice. On, and that was radar us was that app. Uh, that one's really seems to work well. Um, having a, your GPS, because your GPS is going to help you figure out the currents. Um, we talk a lot about that at the school. Um, a probe, the fish hawk probe, if you can afford one of those, that will also help you figure out the current downstairs while you're out there. Um, and then learning to use your GPS um, and to think like a grid. Um, my, my last two books talk about this. We talk about this at the school. But it's a big lake out there. And when you're out there, you're not, you know, I'm northeast of the smokestack or the harbor or whatever. You're like, where where am I? No, <laughs> you learn how to use the GPS and the latitude, longitude, and read the numbers and how it all looks. You know exactly where you're at. So when you find a pot of bait fish out there or a school of steelhead out there, you, you, you get back on them. Um, that's the most important thing. You know, obviously having some form of communication for safety, um, marine radio, cell phone, um, knowing someone else who's out there. Um, um, and then water temperature. Um, in the spring, if you're blasting out there for steelhead, you know, then you can always, if it's not cloudy, you can look at the satellite imagery that gives you the water temps. That's helpful. Um, so, yeah, that's a short answer. Got it. Got it. Well, I know we're coming up here on on our time with you. Um, we will definitely be setting something up because I think there's, there's still just so much more to pick your brain about and and maybe some other specific areas to kind of focus the conversation on. So we'll work on that. I think the the big thing for everyone is uh, one. You know, we have uh, Captain Keating's books available at the store. Um, books and the DVDs, and the DVDs yep. here. So when you do stop in, you can get that. Uh, the school will be coming up in January. So uh, you can go to the website. Captain Keating, what's the website? Yo, Captain, it's CaptainDanKeating.com. There. So you can sign up there. We'll also link to it down below. So you can go down in the description and uh, pull it from there. So you can get yourself reserved in there because there there is limited spots on day two for the advanced stuff. Um, day one should be pretty good for that. But you still want to just lock in your stuff early. Uh, come on by. We'll have... As he mentioned, the best donuts, which I'm looking forward to. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, of course, we'll, we'll have the gear. We have a lot of stuff that came in. We're setting it all up. And uh, as many of you know that have been here throughout uh, 2021, with all the craziness of shipping, importing, exporting, and stuff sitting on uh, out in the ports, it's hard to get stuff. Um, so while we do have it, we do definitely encourage you just to get it. So you make sure you're ready to go. For get it while you can. Yeah. It's not even like us trying to sell you necessarily. It's just like, if you're going to come back and like, Rob, you don't have this Rob. Like, dude, we had it two months ago, but yep. it's gone now. I mean, we can't help that. Um, so, uh, make sure you guys are checking everything out. Uh, Captain Keating, a real pleasure. Thank you for this, for this, uh, conversation. And uh, I'm looking forward to. To to the few more, we're gonna get you at least two or three more in there, right? Hopefully. Yeah, I can't wait to talk about currents. Currents. That's like the most common conversation among charters and tournament guys in this store. It's like a daily thing. What are the, what are the currents like? You know, what angle were you fishing? All that stuff. That's 
Like the guys that are top fishermen, it's all they talk about. Yeah. More so than lures or anything. That'll so. be a definitely more advanced conversation because yeah. <laughs> there's a lot to that. It's very nuanced. I that think. one might you might be better off just coming to the class for that. Well, one. no, for sure, yeah. for sure. And and maybe there's like a podcast episode after afterwards that we do mm-hmm. that is like a summation of it, like a uh, you know just kind of give you the the core idea and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Because some things you need to kind of experience. I know Captain Keen's going to have the charts and. You know, all the all the graphics that will yep. really, you know, for people that visual that need to kind of see it because um, it, it, it's tricky. Um, as as you mentioned, like the fish hawk, you know, when we talk about currents, there's the currents on top, right? On the waves as you're sitting on top of the water from the winds. We're, and then there's the entire current under the water down 80, 90, 100 plus feet that yep. is doing it could be i mean we've we experienced it you you've got the wind blowing from say the e or say the west but the prior days it was strong super strong east that current is still under the water doing one thing in that surface layer so you got like this real turbulent situation going on and we uh, yeah we so it makes it fun it makes it challenging fun but <laughs> it, it does make it gratifying when you do catch fish in those yep. conditions they're like yeah i've 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 I figured it out mm-hmm. to, to an extent, you know? Yep. And I don't know how many times that we were out fishing and I just kind of thought about conversations that I had with Dan in the past where he said, you know, we're fishing over here and I did this kind of an angle and then we caught fish and, you know, I just changed, you know, turned the autopilot a little bit, a couple different adjustments and all of a sudden without changing a single lure, we were catching a bunch of fish, yeah. you know? Yeah. That happens quite, quite a bit, right? That mm-hmm. little, just a little angle, your, your, your angle of approach just, sets it up and, and you, you know, everything's going on. Uh, Captain Kitty, any final words? Hey, can we do an episode on smoking, smoking salmon? Oh, yeah. oh awesome. we were or, thinking about dude, that. Are you kidding me? Hell yeah. yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Brewing how to brew beer. Maybe a local. <laughs> I was that just going to say, salmon IPA? I knew that was coming. Is, next. is it a salmon IPA? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be the first of its kind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, guys, thank you for joining us on this episode with Captain Dan Keating. Hopefully, hopefully you've gotten some value out of this episode. If you did, throw it a thumbs up, um, subscribe, uh, hit the follow. Um, we'll link to Captain Keating down below his website, his information. You want to get in contact with him for, for whatever reason, you can reach out um, and feel free to stop by the store. Uh, we're here. We've got the hours listed for the kind of off season winter period. Um, come get anything you might need in advance. We've got stuff coming in daily and yep. weekly and uh, especially those coveted. Uh, should I, not, I shouldn't say it right now. We shouldn't say that. <laughs> secret stuff <laughs> those those short plump little things that you guys like in the spring mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> so thank I you guys for talking jo- about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you guys for joining us and we'll see you guys on the next episode